really excited to be speaking to Becky Latham, who is the Deputy Literary Manager at the RSC. Hi Becky, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Uh, good, I'm doing really well, thank you. So Becky, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into theatre? Yeah, so uh, this feels like I'm going way back, back into the past, but I guess it's helpful information. I um, was born in England, but when I was 14, I moved to Australia and I lived there for 10 years. So I went to school and university in Sydney. And I guess that's important because my first sort of introduction to theatre was mostly through Australian theatre makers. So uh, I was really into drama when I was at school and I did drama for my um, HSC, which the equivalent of that obviously is at your A-levels over here. Um, and I really, really thought I wanted to be an actor, but I wasn't very good at acting, uh, which took me a long time to realise. Um, I starred in an Amdram production of a Noel Coward play, playing an Italian maid, which was the real highlight of my career, which you can imagine is not a very lustrous career. Um, and then when I was at university, I was quite shy and it took me a while to sort of take part in the drama society. But when I did, I think the thing that really interested me was sort of the discussions that we were having about plays rather than the acting side of things. And I saw a few productions in Australia, which I just, nothing made me feel like that other than theatre, to be honest. Um, I found it just like completely transformative and magic to sit in a theatre and watch some of those shows. So I sort of knew that I wanted to be in that environment, but didn't exactly know what that was. Um, so when I graduated from university, I went sort of traveling for about three months and I spent some time in London I knew that I sort of wanted to move back to the UK to be closer to Europe. And I met with um, Leila from the Arcola Theatre and spoke to her about potentially doing an internship at the Arcola if I was going to move over to London. So it was nice to sort of know that I had a connection already. I went back to Sydney, sort of worked full time in a cafe to save up enough money to move over. And then I moved to London in 2013, I think. Um, and I was interning at the Arcola for like three days a week, whilst then I would work four days a week to sort of supplement that because it was an unpaid internship. Um, and that sort of, I guess, that was my first start in theatre. Wow, it's it's so interesting to hear people's journeys, how they get into theatre, because it's so different for everyone. And it always seems that, um, you know, people kind of try out one role, you know, wanted to be an actor or wanted to be a writer. And then, you know, their path, it takes them on a different path to something that they kind of really want to do and to figure that out kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. And I didn't study drama when I was at uni either. I was doing, I did sort of all sorts of things. I did uh, history and anthropology and French and English. I majored in English, but I didn't study any sort of drama at all during uh, my time at uni. So it really was just sort of like a passion project on the side. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to London, that was sort of the first time where I was like, I really want to do this, whatever that means. But I did... I mean, even coming with like a university degree and having seen some shows, I really felt uh, behind in some ways, which I think is mad when I think about being a 23 year old already feeling behind. But I felt like I had so much to learn. Yeah, I guess it's like that sometimes when you um, don't come from a, you know, a, a background studying theatre, it's that feeling that you want to kind of pick up on everything. But I'm sure it's already there, you know, when you go and see shows and, you know, kind of network with people in the industry as well. It kind of comes doesn't it yeah I completely agree and um so was there kind of a moment when you thought actually do you know what I'd really like to work in a literature department was that kind of a light bulb moment or yeah I guess so when I was at the Arcola um Layla asked me to read lots of plays and that was sort of the first time that I'd sat down and read a play rather than going to see a play and I found it really uh interesting to see how the rhythms of the writing looked on the page and also the level of sort of independent curiosity that it takes for a reader to sort of imagine what that might look like without the aid of like a designer or a director. So you sort of are in full charge of what that production might be when you're reading it for the first time. And then 
uh, after the Arcola, I did a three month internship with Rain Dance Film Festival, where I watched like short films three days a week for like eight hours a day, which was amazing. And it was really cool to sort of work in a work looking with at a different medium. I've always really loved films. Uh, and then I worked for a really small film production company, which was great for about a year. And then after that, so that's like two years in London, I got a job. Uh, I got an internship rather at the Old Vic Theatre. So I was in their Old Vic New Voices department, which the name of that has now been changed, I think. But at the time it was headed up by Alexander Ferris and Hannah Fosker and they had three strands and it was uh, education, community and talent. And my internship sort of fell over the talent side of things. So they were about to uh, produce a six week new writing festival. And I got to spend lots of my internships sort of assisting and helping on that festival. So I guess it was the first time where I had met an up and coming generation of directors and writers who were currently making work. And I was so excited by being a part of that project, reading all those plays. And I just found the readings um, really so like so varied I think we did like 12 of them in total and it blew my mind I guess like the difference between the plays the topics that were covered the forms that we looked at like there were musicals there were um like really naturalistic tight dramas um really bawdy comedies it was uh just really exciting I guess to be exposed to that much work and then I remember talking to Alex about it as part of the internship and he suggested I spoke to Steve at Theatre 503 and then I started reading for Theatre 503 so that was my first time sort of being a reader for a theatre company um, which I loved and then so after my internship at the Old Vic finished I stayed on for three months as the project manager for the Old Vic 12. So it was the First, Old oh, Vic 12, uh, essentially what happened is my internship finished. Someone very generously said that they would donate a sum of money to the Old Vic. But the project needed to have some sort of, uh, I don't know if they use the word star quality, but some element of it that felt exciting or different or like a, a, an offer that wasn't available elsewhere. So Alex the community producer Clemmy Forfar and myself sat in our rehearsal room one afternoon trying to think of, of exciting projects that we could do with that money um, and therefore was born the Old Vic 12. So I worked on that for three months which again was a really strange experience having gone from being an intern to suddenly I was arranging all these interviews for writers. So we, I think we interviewed about 200 writers and I personally interviewed, I think it was something along the lines of like 35 writers, which was amazing. So just completely brilliant getting to meet these people for the first time, listen to their work and ask questions about uh, their ideas and what they wanted to achieve by being attached to the old Vic. And I guess I felt like I was thrown in the deep end a little bit in a good way, but I, I did feel a bit um, like I was making it up as I was going along, which I think is probably key to lots of people getting their first break. Um, and then after that, I got a job at the Almeida Theatre in their participation department, which was brilliant because we worked on lots of projects that sort of sat alongside the main house programme, but they were short term. So we worked with more artists. So you kind of got introduced to this huge uh, catalog sounds really impersonal but um a huge array of artists who I was really excited by that would come in and work with our participants and again I think it was just always the sort of the writing of the plays I found most interesting and then uh I asked if I could be a part of the script it's called script club at the Almeida so I got to uh, sit in a room with uh, Rupert Gould and uh, Rob Icke and some of the associates and people who had been um, like previously had been assistant directors or writers they were interested in and talk about plays that had been sent to the Almeida and I found that really exciting to sit in a room with some really brilliant minds and discuss what might be interesting for the program at the Almeida and then uh, the RSC advertised a position for literary administrator and that was sort of my first 
job within a literary department. Uh, I've been in that team ever since, two and a bit years ago now that I was made the deputy literary manager, which has been great. But yeah, sort of a, a random pathway into being into a literary department, but along the way, always being interested in the new writing side of things. Did that, do you find that kind of all that experience is really valuable in your day-to-day -day job now? Yeah, I think uh, one of the most useful things, and you don't have to acquire this suit through a similar trajectory as what I followed, but one of the things I find most helpful is just a real depth of knowledge of writers. And that sounds really obvious, but I think it's really, really important to have a, a wide knowledge of the types of plays that have been produced over the past, I'm going to talk personally, over the past eight years almost, I've been living in London. Uh, and that's obviously been helped by the sort of work that I've done. So I've been introduced to writers, but also the plays that I've seen. But I think one of the most useful skills that I've acquired is being in a meeting where someone says, we've got this idea or this project, and it's not hard for me to think through the sort of writers that I'm excited by and interested in and have an immediacy to that, to answering that question. And I think that's probably the most uh, useful skill that I currently have. Yeah, that's great. And so what does your what does your role at the RSD involve sort of on a day to day basis or in general? Talent scouting, which sounds very American or very sterile, but having an eye on artists that we might be interested in working with. And that means uh, seeing lots of shows, going to sharings, reading lots of plays and uh, just thinking about the types of opportunities that the RSC might have coming up and who might we want to approach for those opportunities. Um, it also involves dramaturgy as well. So for each show that is programmed at the RSC, one of us will be attached as a dramaturg. And that means working on the commission when it's first commissioned by the RSC and developing it with the writer. And it also means going into rehearsal rooms and being a regular presence in that rehearsal room and being available and also attending previews and giving notes back to the director. So uh, yeah, we'll sort of share that between the team. So that's an integral part of my job. And then there's sort of like the day-to-day -day bits of what it's like working in a literary department for such a massive organization. So attending lots of meetings, um, being available. We work really closely with the producing and casting team. So a lot of my job is uh, organizing the research and development workshops that we might either do on a commission or we might do uh, some speculative R&D. And it's my responsibility to sort of manage those workshops. So, uh, yeah, making sure that we've got space, making sure we've got the resources we need, talking to casting about the play, who we might want to have in that workshop space, and making sure that the writer and director, if we choose to have a director in the workshop, are getting what they need out of that workshop. Um, and then, what else? Uh, we also do a writers group at the RSC, which, um, isn't a sort of traditional writers group. It's not a group where writers are invited along to talk about their work. It's sort of a group that we have uh, that nurtures the writers who are already in contact with us, where we invite in a speaker who doesn't have anything to do with theatre. That's sort of the one rule. So uh, we've previously had speakers come along and talk about being a deep sea ocean explorer or talking about blast injury or, uh, <laughs> talking about water, which sounds weird, but it was one of the most fascinating talks that we had. So it's uh, organizing events like that as well, making sure that our writers feel held by us and that we're in contact with them, which has obviously been a little bit trickier over the past year, but yeah, sort of making sure that our artists are looked after as well is a part of my role. So it's fascinating to hear kind of how varied your role is. I think that's what, um, you know, it's really valuable for, the writers and people watching this um, to kind of it, to get that insight into what a you know a deputy literary manager does because I think we kind of imagine someone sitting in an office receiving lots of scripts reading them you know making contact but to to kind of hear about that process and you know all the different things you do to work with writers and to find writers that's just so interesting to hear that going back to kind of you were talking about your role and how varied it is and it was interesting to hear about um, the dramaturgy that 
you do as well because in some literary departments um, the job title for people working in the department is dramaturg so it's interesting that that's kind of encompassed in your role as well as the kind of reading side of it so do you work with would you be assigned to a writer who you work with all the way through from kind of reading their work initially to you know that being produced somewhere yeah exactly and it's um, it's interesting, I guess, how varied literary departments are from organisation to organisation. I mean, we are really lucky that there's four of us in our team. And I know that lots of literary managers work as sort of a department of one, uh, which is a really different experience. And I also think it's hugely personality driven. And I mean that twofold. I think it's the personality of the artistic director, what they expect of their literary department and what they're interested in. I think it's also down to the personality of the team and how they uh, sort of focus their interests as well. And I think some people are really, really interested in uh, lots of writer development and running the sort of writers groups programs and and the commissioning and the getting the play up to production ready standard and I think other people in literary departments are more interested in in the continuing of that connection to the play as well and sort of getting up on its feet and being a physical presence in the room and ensuring that that dramaturgy continues on um, so yeah, I've been really surprised at how different people's roles are within sort of the literary ecology, I guess. Yeah, this is just so great to hear because it's just, you know, as emerging writers, we send our scripts off, you know, you, you email them, you send the email, it's gone and you don't know where it's where it's necessarily going. Or, you know, someone maybe comes to see a short play you've got on, has to see some of your work and you don't really know where it's going after that. So it's really exciting to kind of hear about kind of how that might work and how there's a team there all working together in different roles. It's just really fascinating. And I'm sure that people watching this will just think, wow, that's just so interesting to know that it goes beyond that kind of just initial reading of the play. Um, how do you, so how do you make contact with new writers? and build those relationships. The way that our commissioning and producing model works is that we tend to commission a writer and develop that play with us. So it, the seed of the idea tends to happen in a meeting with either Pippa or myself. So Pippa's the head of commissioning at the RSC, so she will have a vital role in any commission that takes place. And the reason for that is that, uh, and this might change in the future, but Typically, we have certain uh, things to think about when commissioning work for our stages. So if I use an example of the Swan Theatre, over my time at the RSC, we've needed plays that can accommodate lots of characters, for instance, because normally the play will be programmed in rep with two other plays that already hold a lot of actors. So you might need a play with 16 characters, for instance. You also writing to a space that has multiple exits and uh, entrances that doesn't hold blackouts very well and also doesn't necessarily accommodate naturalism very comfortably. So there are certain requirements or things you should consider when writing for that space. So because the play needs to be quite tailored to the space, it's unlikely that we'll read a play where we'll go, great, let's program this, it's perfect. And I think there's also something exciting about the idea of working in collaboration with the writer to develop that idea that we have found really beneficial for both us, the writer and the play that ultimately gets programmed. So I guess the specificity of the writing has dictated why we work with writers in the way that we do. There are some differences. So for instance, we have a studio space called The Other Place, which is a 200 seat sort of black box theater that can be transformed in any way possible, which the uh, commissioning timeline of that is much shorter than what would happen with the Swan or the RST, which is the biggest stage that we have. So it's more responsive, flexible. The type of work that goes on in there is really, uh, provocative, interesting, mischievous. Uh, it doesn't behave very well in lots of ways. It's just sort of really uh, dynamic, interesting work. And I guess we could, we could read a play that we might go, we could program that in there. Typically what we found more interesting is for us to think of a provocation or something we're interested in exploring that year. So that space is also a, 
sort of like an educational hub. We work closely with the University of Birmingham as well, and we've done lots of uh, seminars and there's just a lot of space for intellectual debate that happens within that building. So I think it's been interesting for us to think of a provocation or some sort of topic that we'd like to discuss. And then we think about writers who might be really interesting to write for that space. Um, the space is, is programmed by Erica Wyman, who's the Deputy Artistic Director of the RSD. And she's just really brilliant at being on the pulse of what audiences might want to consider or think about in a particular moment. Uh, so it's been amazing to work in collaboration with her. So in terms of thinking about writers, I guess it goes back to what I said previously of just making sure we're seeing as much work as possible. We have a very informal group, which I have uh, forced onto the schedule at the RSE called Play Group, which sounds a little bit like we all go into a sandbox or something every Friday morning, but it's a time for uh, the literary team, producers, casting, and sort of anyone who wants to join to come and chat about shows that they've seen, artists they're interested in, to make sure that all of the work that we're covering across the RSC is actually being talked about and we're making sure that we're logging artists who are of interest. We have close relationships with some agents and sometimes an agent might say, I really, really have learnt your taste and I think this writer is really exciting and I, I do think you should read this play. So sometimes we'll read plays through that means, but yeah, most of the time it's it's being proactive and thinking about who we might want to invite into that space. Yeah, I think this is just something that's coming up, you know, through these chats and kind of learning more about literary departments. It really dispels that myth that maybe new playwrights think might happen, you know, when they send a play off or someone comes to see a play or they get an agent for the first time, that that is the play that might be commissioned somewhere. And what seems to be coming up more frequently is actually that's that's almost okay, that might get you noticed, but then it's a long process from that point to kind of developing to the point where you can write something specifically as you were talking for, for that particular space. Um, so that's kind of a, that's an interesting thing for, I think for new playwrights to hear that almost don't be disheartened when that play isn't the one that gets put on, almost don't expect it to kind of be just plucked out of thin air and then be produced, you know. And a lot of it also seems as well, you know, producing your own work and getting it on smaller stages so that people can see you and find out who you are as well. I think that seems to be something that's coming up frequently. Yeah, and I, I guess it's not a discomfort, but I feel sort of saying we don't accept unsolicited scripts, I imagine is uh, disheartening for some writers, but I also think there are so many brilliant organisations that are set up to support that very thing. So Theatre 503, for instance, positioning themselves as being a space where writers get their first play produced, and they're incredible, and some of the writers who've come up through them. And it just feels as though each theatre can't provide everything, and I think there is a really, really brilliant um, sort of peership of theatres who are providing those opportunities. And it's just ensuring that writers know who to have the conversation with at which point. And I guess it's being more uh, open about how those, uh, yeah, how those conversations might work. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because I think, you know, for theatre takes unsolicited scripts but actually can't really do anything with them so for example you know you've talked about the the swan the, the producing plays with 16 characters for example you know and if you accepted unsolicited scripts you'd get two handers four handers um you know first plays or you know things like that so I think if a theatre kind of sets up that level of expectation but really can't kind of do much with more than a handful of scripts then actually that kind of in turn causes that that's disheartening in itself isn't it you know because then new writers send their plays off and they don't hear anything back and nothing really comes of it so actually it's really great to hear why a theatre might not select accept unsolicited scripts it's not like you're saying oh we don't want them because they're not but it's actually saying that, that there's there are places that are best suited to take unsolicited scripts, like places like 503, you know, maybe kind of make contact with those theatres first, and then it's start of a process, isn't it, where you might then come into contact with a theatre like the RSC. Um, and so what do you think, personally, what do you think makes a good script? What makes you excited when you're reading something new? It's a great question. And I guess what many people might say is there's no uh, rule of what makes a good script. What 
And I also should say it's so subjective. So I'm just one person with an opinion and I have certain tastes and things that I find exciting. And that's just my opinion. So if I read your script and have a certain response to it, that doesn't give it a, a value mark or a stamp. It's just how I've responded. But I, I guess I get really excited by a script that feels unlike anything I've read before, which I realize is a bit of like smoke and mirrors, but something that feels uh, electric, like I can't put it down, that is imaginative and bold, that feels provocative and imagine like curious and uh, something that has a real integrity about the characters and an authenticity. It feels like it's grounded in some sort of truth. I also really like to have an emotional response to a play. It doesn't mean that every play needs to make me cry or feel devastated, but I need to relate to it on a really human level for me to feel uh, attached to it in some way, I guess. I think the plays that really excite me are ones that after I read them, I have to have a conversation with someone about it, about what I've just read. I like plays that stay with me, that um, sort of haunt my thoughts. I like plays that are formally inventive, that um, do things with structure or with dialogue that I've not seen before. Um, I guess I really like a play that feels like a conversation you might have with your friends at the pub, but in 10 years time, something that's beyond what you're currently talking about, but that might become commonplace or like the debatable thing in five to 10 years, something that feels like it's looking to the future as well, feels exciting rather than what we're already discussing in the same way we're already discussing it. Um, yeah, so I realise that that's lots of um, random terminology, but I guess, yeah, something that feels bold and curious to me feels exciting. Yeah, I think that's a really great answer because none of that stuff can be second guessed. So I really like that because it's kind of there's a sense, there's a real sense with that, that you as a writer, you know, be authentic and, you know, don't. Don't try and write about the thing that's just current now that everyone's talking about in the same way, I guess, because, yeah, don't, it's kind of not second guessing things, I suppose. Yeah, I guess I don't like to be told what I already know. That feels uh, a bit like you're existing within a comfortable echo chamber, I guess. I don't want to have my, my worldview reinforced. I'd like to be challenged or provoked or... Uh, encouraged to see things slightly differently like that's really exciting and do you think there are any common pitfalls new writers fall into with their scripts yeah so I guess it's just like the opposite of everything I, I said before something that feels safe and contained and certain is, is probably not gonna excite me I think it also just takes a while to to find your voice I think it's like really brave to write a play and I think if you've written a play and you're not quite happy with it and you don't go oh, I really want to send this to the national and they must read it immediately that's also okay I think it's really um an achievement to have written a play and it takes a really long time to find your voice something of an exercise that might be useful is to look at writers that you really really admire and look at their back catalogue and see how they've developed and what skills they've sharpened like I don't want to name any writers who are senior and brilliant but but if you just look back at first plays or as they were discovering what techniques work for them, what subject matters they're interested in. Most of the time you see a clear trajectory of progression and they get bigger and bolder. So it's also not feeling daunted by the prospect of growing because that's okay and everyone's developing. So even if your first play isn't your masterpiece, you still got a first play and that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's a really, really good tip to kind of have a look at the journey of playwrights. Because I think, again, there's that kind of, as you say, it's really brave to write a play and then even more so to kind of put yourself out there and send it off to a theatre or, you know, try and get it produced somewhere. You know, it's really brave and it leaves you feeling a bit vulnerable, doesn't it? So if you're not successful that first time round, it's easy to think, oh, my play isn't just, it just isn't very good. Um, I won't do it again. But actually, you know, everybody improves and everyone's on a journey. So I think that's just such a good tip. Yeah, there's a director who I know um, on press nights for his shows will 
sort of think about all the things that he would critique like what is it that he didn't achieve with this production that is instead of listening to what the reviewers might say or what other people might say is what is it that you as an artist can look at um your play or your production and think what do I need to acquire next time to, to know that I have expanded or developed my skill set to make sure that the production quality grows on my next production or my writing grows for my next play. And I think there is um, a real benefit in getting outside opinion on your plays. I think that's really, really important. But I also think there's a real skill in a writer of knowing what notes to ignore or what notes you can observe as being interesting provocations but actually that's not your intention with this play and I think it's it obviously is different for instance if you've been commissioned by a theatre and you're hoping to get your play programmed I think it's really important that you're listening to those people in terms of their notes that they're giving you but when you're sort of having coffee meetings with people or when you're talking to actors I think it's a real skill to get to a point where you the artist have um a certainty about the choices that you've made and you know that there is an integrity to those choices that is the play that you want. Uh, and I think that's a real skill. And I think perhaps people on their first plays and maybe quite rightly are really willing to hear notes and to be influenced. But I guess as you grow and get emboldened about your uh, voice or what it is that you want to write about, also knowing when to say like this is my choice and I don't want to change that yeah absolutely because you know if you get notes from two or three different people they're not they, they won't all be the same will they you know one person might say I think you should change this someone else might say something completely different so I guess that's something that we need to learn as well isn't it because it doesn't necessarily come naturally I think there's an instinct there to if we get notes to think oh yeah that needs to be changed but um, yeah it's kind of listening to your own voice as well isn't it I suppose and um, what advice would you have for any writers who may be thinking that they'd like to work with the RSC? I really like it when people email me. I know other people don't. And whether it's just to like introduce yourself, say hi, say this is the work that I have coming up. I'd love you to come and see it. Those sorts of emails are always welcome. I guess also there are lots of writers who I'm aware of and the RSC is aware of that might not know that we're already sort of watching their work as well. So I have lots of colleagues, obviously, that work in this industry. And I guess it's being reassured that your work is being watched by lots and lots of people. Like our jobs is to go and proactively seek out writers. So maybe, I guess there's a difficulty, isn't there, of if you're not getting called in for a commission, it doesn't mean that your writing's not being observed and appreciated. So I guess it's twofold. It's being confident that if you have work that is being produced and programmed, that um, people are probably watching it and excited by you, but also not feeling shy to approach theatres as well and just introduce yourself, even if they can't offer you a commission. It's just really brilliant to get connections with theatres and grow those relationships. And from my experience, and it changes, I guess, depending on people's capacity, but uh, most people are really willing to engage, have a coffee, have a chat, if that's helpful. Some writers don't find it that helpful to have a general coffee chat and it can feel like a distraction from their day and that's also completely fine. I think it's everyone having a level of transparency about what they want out of those meetings. So if it is just to say hi, I'm so up for those meetings. But also, I guess it's me coming to that meeting saying I don't have anything to offer at the moment, but I, I would be really willing to have a conversation. So I guess it's about feeling emboldened to approach theatres and just introduce yourself, making sure people know when your work is on um, and not feeling disheartened as well if you don't get a flood of commissions coming in straight away because um yeah it just it just takes a long time that's great I mean because I think that's little known that you know someone that people are watching your work I think that would surprise a lot of new writers to think that someone from the RSC might come and see your play if it's on you know if they can so I think that's just great and to remember it's a it's a process as well and it's a it's a journey and it's not something that happens really quickly I think that's something that we all need to bear in mind as writers when we're submitting work and making that contact with theatres that it doesn't happen overnight um, 
Yeah, and also just the truth that everyone is feeling vulnerable and it might look really differently. So if someone gets the play announced and you feel like I've got two brilliant ideas and my play has never been programmed, like I guess sometimes looks can be deceiving and you can think that some writers have it made and thinking about what would feel like an achievement for you like what what would you like to happen in in a few years time what would feel like a real achievement and what did, what yeah what individual journey would you feel really proud of and just kind of forgetting the noise of what everyone else is doing because I think sometimes that becomes very um loud which isn't helpful and just finally quickly would you also have any advice for any literary creatives who want to maybe get involved with a literary department if you look at the people who are literary managers sometimes it could be a bit daunting to think wow that person's been in their job for a really long time there are only finite opportunities available and I think that's true to an extent but I also think there are lots of jobs that don't have the title of literary manager or dramaturg where you are doing some of that work and you are growing your CV so for instance I did lots of work in education departments and a lot of that work was working on new plays with writers and directors and growing that skill set and also being introduced to lots of brilliant artists. So I think sometimes, uh, yeah, the job might not have the job description or the title that you think you'd like, but within that job, there is scope to do lots of things that you're really um, switched on about. And I also think um, reviewing is a really, really helpful way to see lots of plays for free. So that was really helpful. When I first moved to London, I, was reviewing for a younger theatre and the first show that I saw was Faust at the Royal Opera House and I remember thinking like I never thought I would see an opera and I was sitting on a row where seats were like they were expensive and I wouldn't have been able to buy a ticket there and I'm sitting amongst people who are like you are not my peers but it was one of the most incredible theatrical experiences and I felt really um, inspired after that and I think being introduced to lots of different art forms is really integral to working out your taste and you should challenge the boundaries of your taste constantly. Thank you, Becky. That's been such a great conversation. Thanks so much for your time today. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Oh, you're welcome. It's been lovely to chat to you too. Hey.